with the Honduran uh, social movements, campesino movements, indigenous movements since about 1999. And prior to that, I've been a long time activist in anti-war, anti-imperialist, and solidarity movements for a long time. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. And this is Lara Nussbaum Barberina. She's a member of La Voz de los de Abajo, and she's a academic who specializes in Central America anthropology, but the good anthropology. <laughs> And we don't have a lot of time, but we thought we'd go through some uh, current events, past events, to really paint the picture of uh, Latin America and, and peace and the lack of their culture. So we thought we'd do the next talk and, and do some activities just to kind of get to get almost a physical sense of our argument that peace is more than the absence of war, which is what we um, title this. Um, and, and, and often, so often, peace, what is what is billed, um, especially in the United States, as peace in Latin America, uh, is, is often some of the most repressive conditions for people living in, in, in Latin America and, and when people are actually working towards peace, their, their, their efforts are, are blocked. Um, and so we're, we're, we've kind of, obviously Latin America comes out of a colonial history um, with Europe. We're not going to talk too much about that today. We're going to focus more on um, the start of US interactions with Latin America. Um, We'll, we'll kind of start with that relationship and by the end move towards movements within Latin America because it's not to say that everything in Latin America is shaped, is <coughs> entirely shaped by the U.S. We uh, both are, uh, we are both um, in constant interaction with um, social, move, active social movements. Um, uh, throughout Latin America. Um, so we fully believe that there are people working um, for something different, but I, I, I think that we can never, ever talk about um, what happens in Latin America without understanding um, its, its relationship with, with the U.S. over the past 200 years. Um, or more. It's not a pretty sight. It's not a pretty no. sight. <laughs> but we actually wanted, um, you know, one of the things is if just, not just understanding these as kind of random acts, um, that pop, things that pop up every once in a while, but a set of a, a continual set of concerted policies towards Latin America, um, um, or kind of U.S. stance within the U.S. Western Hemisphere, um, and so what we thought is we'd have you join us in, in kind of bringing to mind what some of these policies are. So we'd love it if anyone who wants to would come up and um, write um, on each of these policies any sense you have of what period this refers to, what they're about. Um, uh, to, to get our conversation going about U.S. policy in Latin America since, since the mid-1800s. <laughs> 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 Not that we expect you to, but we'd love to get a sense of what people already know in the room. I know she said I'm a professor, but I, I, don't, love t I don't like testing people. <laughs> I just want to get everyone part of the conversation and build on what we already know. Um, I guess I'm here because I feel like I know a ridiculously little amount. Awesome. Okay, so that I'm here to gain information. Perfect. So you have all those things up there, and I would be clueless as to where to start. Absolutely. Which is why I'm here to begin with. Wonderful. Good. We will, and we will go over them. I just want to invite people to also participate in them with what they know. Well, I suspect the big uh, stick diplomacy is 
around 1898, mm -hmm. um, McKinley, but particularly Teddy Roosevelt um, era. Yeah. And how did that manifest itself? What would you say? I mean, what did it look like? What did it feel like for the people in Mexico? Oh, Mexico. Well, I can't or really. What was the game in the United States? There happened to be a war. <laughs> <laughs> right. Remember the main. Yeah, there are some hands back here. I'm sure. Doesn't it basically honestly just speak to like, the American mindset of like being diplomatic but truly just holding like some sense of threat of our military over people's like, like big state like aggression? Yeah, so bringing, so bringing military into the question to, to enact policies that favor the U.S. Yeah. yeah, when I say the TR, I think we fomented revolution in Colombia to get Panama to secede so we could go down. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, we have, we, have, we have territorial geopolitical um, games that are tied up with this policy. Well, there was opposition to the, um, the, the Roosevelt McKinley Mm -hmm. uh, crap that was going on with the anti-imperialist league, mm -hmm. uh, uh, led led by, <coughs> among others, Mark Twain. Most of the black newspapers at that time were were against U.S. military intervention. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know if this is correct or not, but Alliance for fine. Progress I associate with Kennedy. Um, the reputation of being peace loving, you know, freedom for all peoples around the world, and president. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the fragments, but I, I know the structural adjustment stuff was going on in the 90s. Mm -hmm. The IMF got all these countries deeply indebted, and they lent them money to dig out of their debt only on condition that they adopt these structural adjustment policies, which meant heavy privatization, slashing social programs, um, you know, just the whole neoliberal thing was forced on these countries and it stunk. And we were moving U.S. manufacturing was moving down there because the wages were so low. So it was the time when you, you started left-wing newspapers were reminding us to look at the labels in our clothing. They were made in Mexico or Iraq or places where all this stuff was happening. Mm -hmm. Um, with, to add to structural adjustment, I read an excellent book called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anybody's read it? Okay. <laughs> well, was there something to uh, well, from that? And it just really opened my eyes that when I hear people in general who don't really follow the news say, well, America helps so many other countries, mm -hmm. but we don't help ourselves, I, I give them that, that, that book and tell them that we actually, there are strings attached, and it's a pretty bad condition that we put countries in there. Awesome. Thank you for the start, everyone. Um, yeah, so we, you know, much of this really starts when, you know, the U.S. Um, begins to organize itself and begins to organize its, its part in the global market. And so a lot of the policy towards Latin America comes at the, at, the, at the time that the global market really explodes, right? And so in the mid-1800s, right, we get this little thing happening over here. Anyone want to? What's out happening over the West Coast that, where gold the United rush. States government gets interested in the West Coast? Gold rush. Yeah, gold rush. And so at that point, right, you have to go all the way down and up again, right? Um, and so we get this interest, we get interest, right, in both these trade routes, right, um, shipping, potential shipping lanes in the Caribbean 
and then this really thin part of the isthmus um, that's Central America. And we start, we start seeing interventions happening then, right? We, we get, um, but the, you know, and we see, we have the Monroe document, Doctrine, right? Originally, in the early 1800s, America for the Americas. But around that time, we start getting this attitude: well, America for the United States, the Americas for the United States. Um, and 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 so that turns into this idea: well, then the U.S. gets to determine where the canal will go. Um, so this is when we start to see these military interventions to prevent, um, say, Nicaragua from building its own canal, right? And, and Nicaragua is actively flaunting the United States command that they not build a canal once the US had chosen this little spot in what is now Panama, it was Colombia, until the United States wanted to build a canal there, right? Do that, um, right? Which means that you can easily get people through here, right? Which, which is a lot easier than overland in the US, but you can also get all these products um, that are developing um, in these countries, both out to the US, up the Mississippi, and out to Europe, European markets. And, we, and so first we get Roosevelt, and the big stick is military landings, right? When, when countries flaunt this, they land the military, right? We move on to Taft, who says, OK, pull it back, it's a little criticism of this outright military uh, marine occupations of different countries, right? Um, we're gonna control financial and um, political institutions. So now diplomacy is through control of the economic systems, and to control the economic system, of course you have to control the political system, right? So taking over at literally people from the US heading those institutions federal things, um, military, a whole, range of, a whole range of things. And then we get um, installation of dictators. And so this is Roosevelt, actually, there's the Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, which is US as the police force. The US gets the right to enforce Europe's um, exit from, from there. And one, one of the things that you know, most of Latin America had been completely sacked already, right? There wasn't a lot of capital to do the kinds of projects they needed to do to get on the world market. So they started courting, courting European funding for that, right? At the risk, and I, and I like to, I think there's this question of, well, why did people do that? What else would they do, right? In a, a Nicaragua is a tiny country. I will always back, go back to Nicaragua and the examples uh, I'll tell you ahead of time because that's where that's where I've lived, the, where I've lived, where I live, and my family is, and um, where I do the most work. Um, and I'm going to talk too much. I'm, I'm going to shut it down. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, but Nicaragua knew they. Nicaragua's history is just cycles of figuring out how do we move this project ahead. Um, we can't do it without inviting someone else <coughs> in. So we have a careful balance between things. One time they invited Vanderbilt to build a railroad and overseas kind of half sea, half overland passage. And of course he tried to take over. So then they invited William Walker, who tried to make Central America the final slave state to tip the balance, right? He declared himself president. Um, those people were both invited to Nicaragua. They were different <coughs> attempts to try and build Nicaragua's economy this tiny backwater, um, backwater uh, post-colonial state. Um, and I just forgot. Um, we have policies to support governments that are friendly to the United States, right, and the good neighbor policy. Um, right, this, this is more, we're moving into the, you know, this is, the early 1900s, this is the kind of teens, right? Um, uh, here's, we're into the 20s and, and 30s. We can jump to, um, right, there's a kind of retraction, um, in, right, during the, during the World Wars, there's a little bit less ability to, 
to, to push out. Um, but then we get the Alliance for Progress, and the Alliance for Progress, um, what, what the Good Neighbor Policy has done is installed a lot of um, US friendly governments. So the US did not have to be intervening as directly, right? They could simply uh, continue to, um, to support, um, support um, incredibly repressive governments. Um, and often governments that were that were, were implementing policies that were completely contradictory to what, where the social trends and laws and policies were moving in the US. Um, uh, the Alliance for Progress, right, as, as things became so repressive, people became so impoverished, there was an idea that, okay, if we give countries just enough money, we'll keep them from turning to communism. Right. So this was Kennedy's policy. This is where we get the Peace Corps, right? With the idea we'll send these, send these young American kids to help people understand that Americans are good people, right? Um, and, and so that they don't turn <coughs> towards communism. Um, we get just enough investment. We get agricultural reforms, very minimal, but agricultural reform being supported by the U.S in Latin American countries, so it would give people just enough land that they wouldn't um, turn towards revolution, and revolution, right, follow the trends of revolutions that were happening um, throughout, right? We had a spring of revolutions in the 20s, um, and when, then we start having them again, right, starting with the Cuban Revolution in the 50s. Um, and then we have the revolutions. Then we have another round of revolutions, because this ultimately fails. Um, but at the same time, we get these, um, another way to control things is we get these lending policies um, by the World Bank and the IMF. They, they put a ton of money into Latin America towards infrastructure, pro infrastructure projects that ultimately fail. Um, and people can't, you know, with the oil crisis in the 70s, we get people start, uh, people, countries start defaulting on their debts, and we get the support, uh, support as well as new dictatorships. Um, and we get these um, policies that have these pretty names like structural adjustment and stabilization that are actually about gutting, gutting the state, gutting the state. Um, at, at least cutting much more. <laughs> um, but cutting all these. Um, policies where governments are investing in the people, creating national health care systems, creating national education systems, um, natural, national agricultural um, investment, national industries, right? All that required that the states pull back from that and allow those in, to go into private hands. Um, and this is where we find ourselves today. But we also wanted to point out with this that we have a whole, a whole set of different strategies um, that are used to control um, the politics and, and, and social, social life throughout Latin America. Um, whether it's direct military intervention, um, whether it's putting money into economies in very limited and specific ways, or upholding, upholding dictatorships. And upholding dictatorships again. <laughs> The 1980s. Yeah. We see them throughout. They're very uneven. They're very different in each country. I think is also something. So not each each of these looks a little bit different. Um, yeah. And that's it. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so. The idea of doing this was to try a different way of showing sort of the, the continuity of U.S. involvement in policy and how it has its ups and downs and euphemisms, but it's pretty much always the same thing. Uh, what I wanted to do was talk a little bit more about some of the actual interventions and tools that U.S. uses to dominate and control to the extent that it's able, which is luckily not always able to do so, in Latin America. And the, so this 
is sort of this, we thought we could map a little bit, maybe if a couple of people would help me. But I wanted to talk about the, the U.S. has a whole toolbox, and that toolbox includes <coughs> military interventions, direct, overt invasions and occupations. Uh, a few that come to mind are all of Central America in the 80s, Panama in 1989, Mexico, in 1848 is when the when the, the war ended, the Mexican-American War. So that's always been a big tool. Also, covert interventions and operations from the CIA to the DEA. The war on drugs is in many ways a covert operation into countries used to control society and not so much to actually control the narcotics flow. Um, other things that, that are used are social, covert social operations. One of the most famous being Operation, uh, it, there's a movie called Blood of the Condor from Bolivia that maps interventions by the U.S. and Europeans that sterilize, forcibly sterilize without their knowledge, uh, large numbers of indigenous women in the Andes. There was also forced sterilization used against Puerto Rican women in particular uh, as a condition of uh, welfare rights in the 60s. So there's all these different, the, the toolbox is very big. Also coup d'etats, and what, so we have this traditional military coup d'etat, the army comes in, drags the president of a country out, and we thought that that was kind of, uh, you, you know, that was over with, but in 2009, Honduras, which is a country where I spend the most time, 2009 they did just exactly that dragged the president out of his house, put him on an airplane, and dumped him in Costa Rica on the, on the tarmac. <laughs> so, in fact, the traditional military-style coup d'etat is very much with us. But they've added another weapon, which is the political coup. And in the case of uh, Zelaya, President Zelaya in Honduras, they combined it. So first they dragged him out and dumped him. Then Congress declared that it was, a, it was a, like an impeachment. And at first they said he resigned, which he didn't. Then they said, okay, well, he didn't resign but we've impeached him, which they didn't. They actually arrested him and threw him out of the country. But we've seen more political coups coming up, for example, Paraguay, uh, where Lugo was impeached without any legal basis, or Brazil, where we have President Delma Rousseff was impeached for corruption, although pretty shaky terms and did not follow the course of law that it should have happened in Brazil. So that, those are some more tools. Economic political sanctions. So we have those against Venezuela right now as part of perhaps uh, an ongoing coup or an attempted coup that's being a slow coup. We might be seeing a new tool in their toolbox. But also the use of sanctions, the embargo against Cuba, sanctions against Venezuela currently, all aimed at bringing a country into submission, which is generally the goal of all U.S. policy in, in Latin America. U.S. supported authoritarian regimes comes right after that. Uh, we have the new dictator in Brazil. We have the dictator in Honduras. Uh, you know, if you're their friend, it doesn't matter what you do. You're their friend and they'll support you. If you're their enemy, it doesn't matter what you do <laughs> because you're the enemy and you will be dumped. Um, the structural adjustments, which I think we've talked a lot about. And the other piece of it is an ongoing, very significant militarization in which the U.S. may not have more very many troops. In Honduras there's about 800 troops uh, plus more from the DEA, but they have 13 military facilities. And this is a country that only has 8.5 million people, so it starts to, the presence is very militarizing. And they are, they, in this, in this model, they are training, arming, uh, they're training a large number at Fort Benning still, at the school, no longer the School of Americas, but it is. Uh, it's training also police forces in Mexico, in Honduras, in Guatemala, for Costa sure. Rica. Mm -hmm. In Costa don't Rica. They don't have a military. Yeah. Yeah. They, have, they have a military, they just don't call it a military. <laughs> so the, the mili spreading militarization, which is used primarily against the people and the social movements, and revolutionary movements. Both the social movements that are just making demands for things like uh, agrarian reform, indigenous rights, and the revolutionary movements that dare to raise their heads in any of these countries. 
So those are some, and I don't know if someone, I think it would be really useful if people would, one or two people would come up and help me mark the map. Come on guys, I know we got one or two people who will come up here and help me. Because it would take a really long time otherwise. And I have a couple of cheat sheets here. Just to, uh, well, somebody, if somebody will come help me mark them. Come on, we're not going to leave you alone in front of the whole group. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's no marking. <laughs> so that's our color code. Here's our little stickies. So grab some stickies. I'm not sure how you want to do that. So that's there, there was there a rather go. dramatic intervention in Chile. Right. <laughs> so that is a coup. A coup. Here you go. Coups. Yeah. See, just grab, you'll see. So, as part of part of the cheat sheet, just grab and stick. If you know something, I could have missed it because there's so many. One one sticker per country. So even if they had four coups, just one sticker because they're impossible. <laughs> so here's a list of some of the coups that I've been able to to target. Argentina, 1976 military coup. Belize, 2005 military coup. Chile, 1973, Brazil, 1964, military coup, and 2016, political coup. I don't know if they should get two for that. Paraguay, political coup. <coughs> Bolivia, so many coups that we're not even sure how many, but a number that were pro-U.S., and I'm only talking about pro-U.S. Bolivia has the distinction of also overthrowing a whole lot of dictators with their own, like, people's coups. But we're not dealing with that. Ecuador, 1961. Venezuela, an attempted coup in 2002 that failed. And now a slow, ongoing coup being attempted. Uruguay. Argentina, 1976. Ecuador. As many as you can find. <laughs> the, the point being, if we map them, you'll really get a feel for how overwhelming the U.S. interventions have been. Military invasions or interventions from 1846 to 2019. And the invasions are blue. <laughs> Bolivia, 1967. Cuba, 1898, 1912, 1917, 1931 and 1961, and I think I might have missed one or two tiny invasions. Dominican Republic, Jesus. 1904. They were occupied by the U.S. military from 1916 until 1924, and another coup, uh, 1965. El Salvador, 1932. From 1980 to 1992, ongoing military intervention during the, the, uh, at the counterinsurgency wars. Grenada, 1983. Guatemala, 1962. From 1966 to 1978, continuous and ongoing military intervention supporting the ultra-right wing. Haiti was invaded in 1915. Honduras was invaded by U.S. troops in 1905. And between 1905 and 1925, there were five different military invasions by U.S. or incursions. And then from 1980 to 1990, Honduras served basically as a base of operations for the U.S. military against both Nicaragua and against the insurgency in El Salvador and Guatemala. Mexico. There was the, Mex the U.S. invaded Mexico continually from 1846 to 1848. That's the Mexican-American War. In 1905, it sent troops in again. In 1914, uh, after the revolution started, it, the U.S. didn't like it much, and they sent troops in to try and mess with it, but they were not able to stop it. And in 1917, still during the revolution. Nicaragua, 1910, 1912, 1926, 1933, and then continuous incursions through the proxy and advisors from 1980 until 1990. Panama, 
From 1908 to 1918, there were four separate U.S. military invasions. From 1918 to 1920, it was occupied by U.S. troops. And there were further invasions in 1925 and 1989. So these, like I said, we're probably missing some of them. But this gives you kind of a picture of just how deep, both broad and deep, U.S. imperialism's uh, interests in Latin America go. Yes? And would it be quite possible for us to read If you if you sign it, give yeah. us your email in a legible fashion to your <laughs> name, then we'd be happy to share some of the materials with you. Uh, you and then you, sir. I just uh, wanted to particularize a little bit, and that's the seizure, because Allende talked about it, and our bands talked about it, the seizure of the local economy by U.S. corporations. And in, in, in that, the, there's, there's a lot. In the Central America region in particular, and part of the coastal, you have the, the interests of the fruit companies, famous, right? Mm -hmm. British and U.S., with the U.S. then becoming dominant. Uh, and in Honduras, for example, Dole, which is the newest version of Standard, I think, it still exists, although it's supposedly uh, Honduran-owned. But the guy who's the president used to be the head of security when it was an uh, upfront U.S. company. Mm -hmm. So it's still it's the same, and it's part of the corporations. Mm -hmm. so go ahead. And I was just going to say, one of the least, I think, pretty much, as far as I can tell, no one knows it except for this one person who I found in her book. <laughs> when anthropologists I found in her book. Um, Costa Rica, so Honduras became the launching pad um, for the, con the con counter revolutionary force, the Contras. Um, uh, to, to defeat other Central American revolutionary efforts. Costa Rica, um, the U.S. decided to make its neoliberal sh showcase. And so at the same time that they were implementing vast structural adjustment policies, they also, USAID was second only per capita to Israel um, in Costa Rica. Why? Because they could slash all the public sp spending in the long term, but in the short term, it made it their kind of shining star um, to, sh to say, oh, look, this is, demo this is a democratic state, and look what happens when you follow US prescriptions and you, you don't um, renege on your debts. And that's a completely erroneous. Costa Rica tried to stop paying its debts. And they, at one point, they um, actually refused to do so. But there was also actually a lot of revolutionary significant revolutionary sentiment, even though the things were pretty stable and there's a long history. My argument is Costa Rica is stable because the rest of Central America is, is not, and that has a very, very long. That also goes back to this peri periods. Um, it just gets hidden, but it allows Costa Rica to be this kind of pivoting point and people to make the argument that look, when you, sh when you follow the US, when you practice this kind of uh, Capitalism is capitalism. That's under. Um, so, um, you will do well, right? Um, so there are all these hidden things, and like they were sending, they were um, in the 2000s, early 2000s. Everyone was organizing to bring to light the fact that they were about to send their police forces to the School of the Americas for training. Um, and what a lot of front my friends in the working class neighborhoods say is. They don't even cut, the regular police don't come in anymore. It's the anti motinas it's the, it's the riot police. Just go straight into those neighborhoods when anything happens. So just the, the amount of control and the ability to control the image of what is going on throughout Latin America is, makes it really um, difficult to, to even see just the, what, what the norm is. 
what the kind of baseline is um, for violence and mm -hmm. So, go ahead. So if you've got, a, if you've got something first, I'd be... No, no, go ahead if you had a, a question. Yeah. Um, for either of you, yeah. I just wonder, has there ever been any uh, benign corporate intervention? I mean, has there ever been any company that's ever gone in and actually with good intentions tried that's to build a business, pay their uh, you know, people that are working for them fairly, extract a profit, but not at the cost of the environment and the people? I mean, has there ever been anything like that? Or no? Nope. I, none come to mind. I, I, <laughs> I mean, there, there's, you know, there's good in, the, you know, there are smaller groups that have good intentions, but they don't understand the coloniality and they don't understand the problem of the hierarchies or the problem of, you know, ultimately, if you're a foreign company, everything, you know, your profits don't stay within the countries. And I think so. There, I think there are. I wouldn't say there's any large corporation. I think there's. Um, you know, people who go down and start hotels and they think they're um, helping the local economy, but they're just creating new, new dependencies and new, new like, you know, kind of smaller scale levels at which money flows out um, and pushing, and they're often displacing people too from from their. Do you have any explanation for why we have left Cuba alone? even after the fall of the Soviet Union when we could have done it? I mean, before the fall of the Soviet Union, it's oh. obvious why we did not go in. But is there any explanation for our restraint there? I mean, I, th I feel like they tried it so many, you know, they tried, they, at one point, right, the social part, the belief part, Charismatic leaders are so important that you know they you know they they tried to uh, put stuff in Fidel's cigar so his yeah. beard would fall out, hoping that maybe his beard was the <coughs> core of the you know, you know people's <laughs> belief in him. And it, like it's it's so ridiculous and it's so true. Um, you can look at the. Uh, now I'm not going to go down. It's not going to do a tangent right now. But I I think there's a, a ultimately. I don't know. I think there are bigger fish, fish to fry, but they also have the, you know, there's the embargo, which also controls, right, the, the embargoes control countries so entirely that there's, there's the ability to kind of build up an economy and become a power again is, is, is completely limited by that. By that I think that, that the, the answer following what we know to be true always um, is that the, the cost would be too high, that they calculated that the uh, geopolitical, political, diplomatic, um, and public opinion cost uh, just would be too high, that they missed their chance when they might have gotten away with it, uh, 61 being the last time, and they didn't get away with it, and that really soured, I think, the cost-benefit analysis that they do, is that maybe it's not worth it. Um, we could. We need to probably. I want to say a couple more things, and then if we have time, we can have some more questions and answers. I just wanted to to bring up the question. So, the U.S. is a bad player. So, what do we do right here? <laughs> what? Well, and I'm going to narrow it. I mean, there's big issues. Like obviously, we need to do something about the United States. Those of us who live here. Um, but for today, I thought I'd just narrow to a couple of, of campaigns or solidarity things that are that you can participate in. And I handed out a flyer. So it, by, by my way of thinking right now, there's sort of like three countries in Latin America uh, that, are, that are under an intense uh, campaign by, by U.S. imperialists. There's more, but there, there's three that worry me a lot. Honduras, of course, because what we have is a dictatorship where the cost uh, of opposition is going up. The, in, since the 2017 fraudulent elections, which kept the dictator in power, I was there in the streets doing human rights observation, and they escalated to the point where the military police killed people, just pulled out their guns and shot people dead in the neighborhoods. Um, they have political prisoners. The, it's, a, it's a bastion of the extractive economy, which is another thing we didn't get deeply into, but is a hallmark, I think, of not only the U.S., but 
capitalism and imperialist relationships in, in are now very hooked on hydroelectric power. Mining is back. Mm -hmm. If we thought mining was gone, it is back with a vengeance. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're murdering people like Berta Cáceres, the indigenous leader in Honduras. Uh, in Colombia, uh, once again, a peace process was initiated. Uh, and now the U.S. is supporting a, a, a right-wing, a far-right-wing government that is unraveling the peace process. And once again, we're seeing in Colombia continuous <coughs> murders of social movement leaders, trade union leaders, former guerrilla members who in good faith laid their arms down, joined the, the peace process, are being assassinated daily. And the U.S. is very heavily involved in support for the, the it's a kind of dictatorship, won the election, but a very right-wing government. Um, and Venezuela, uh, which is very concerning because we're seeing once again the, U the U.S. destabilizing, threatening military action, using embargoes and economic sanctions, all to only one end, and that's for the U.S. to get control once again of Venezuela and to continue to slap down the, the so-called pink tide the movement towards independent, sovereign, social democratic governments is, is what they were. So those are, are things that are very concerning. Brazil, of course, is another, where, uh, where we have a, the, a, an outrageous right-wing dictatorship, misogynist, homophobic, anti-campesino, anti-everything, who is collaborating with the U.S. to help squeeze Latin America. So in terms of, I think these are things that I would ask people to really educate yourselves on and look for actions. Um, in the piece of paper I handed out, we have the Honduras Solidarity Network is working with a lot of human rights groups in Honduras and social movements. And we're trying again to, in, we're introducing legislature in the House that would cut off all military and security aid, all training until such time as they're the people responsible for the abuses and murders to date are brought to trial and to justice, and that includes the army, the policemen, etc., and that there's a, a documented improvement in human rights. We don't expect it to pass, even with the House we have now, but it's an important part of pressuring the forces in Honduras to, uh, to step back from some of the violence, and it's a way of mobilizing uh, people to understand what the U.S. is supporting in Honduras. And then on Venezuela, the, right now, there's been several big campaigns, but there's going to be, uh, there's been a call for actions. Um, and so I shared the link, the uh, Answer Coalition. We're not members of the Answer Coalition, but they've been doing a lot of mobilizing and activity uh, against U.S. intervention in Venezuela. So I would, I would suggest people look at that. Now, if there's, I don't know how if we have a minute. I just or have one. About five minutes. Oh, okay. 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 I just have a short uh, something to say. I lived in Guatemala for several years, and I could not bear the injustice, the uh, you know, the revolution, the intervention by the United States. If you want to do one tiny thing, just don't buy Chiquita bananas. Okay. <laughs> you, know, you see, truck after truck after truck bringing them down, you know, from the mountains. And what is, somebody here knows the name of the American interests in fruit. What is the name of that company? I've forgotten. Dole. United Dole. Fruit. Dole. No, United, pardon me. United Fruit. United, United Fruit. Fruit. Yes. Yeah. I don't know what if they're still. I so think they're that's, still. That's Chiquita. So oh, that is that, Chiquita. Yeah, it's Chiquita. Oh, okay. Standard Fruit is Dole. Okay. Also. Thank you. Yeah. Did you ever hand up? You have a uh, asked before. Uh, I would suggest uh, people explore finding a way to push back against. U.S. media, because the Washington Post, the New York Times, CNN, et cetera, MSNBC, uh, they're pro, uh, propelling of this attempted U.S. coup in Venezuela is a very good example, calling Maduro a, a dictator and that sort of thing. So find ways to push 
back against uh, establishment media. I think so. And Veal is a, is a journal that comes out of this the University of the Central America, which are Jesuit universities, but it's different. They are really radical. They're radical institutions. They're in, involved in the most radical social movements, uh, you know, the anti-border movements in, in Central America. So it's not, you know, Loyola has more of a, you know, there's this wonderful effort here. But the Jesuit universities here tend to be a little bit more kind of charity oriented in terms of social association in there. It's, it's, it's much more aligned with, with people, um, aligned with the, the revolutions. Um, right? We know that Jesuits were killed in the revolutions as well. But and Vio comes out of there. Um, and so there are these wonderful analyses that's available and it's in English. So if you really want to see what people are talking about in Central America, about Central America, I really recommend starting to look for those kind of resources and they're on our they're on our list here. Yeah. All right, back in the back, then Andy, then the plaid shirt. <laughs> uh, yes, can you briefly touch on the uh, School of the Americas and the whole day play most convention? Um, what about the University of Chicago? Can uh, you yes. maybe speak to that? So the University of Chicago is where Milton Friedman developed the idea of uh, the kind of return to um, freeing the market to uh, the idea that the market left alone could redistribute resources, or that's at least the philosophy you put forward. Um, but certainly the University of Chicago economists, and eventually along with a few other schools, uh, really influenced, you know, they, they were deeply entwined with the dictatorships um, in the 70s and 80s, um, especially in South America where the, the economies, the political systems and economies were completely restructured to basically allow capital to flow out. <laughs> Um, so, and, the, and they were, you know, if you read Naomi Klein's shock doctrine, she really talks about this idea, this kind of, uh, you know, the political economic work going hand in hand in this, in this with this um, social work. And so the idea that you shock everyone back to a clean state. Um, and, and, you know, and what effectively that meant was just terrorizing communities into silence. And, um, and of course, what we do know too there is that the people who really got the word out were women. The Arquillerista movement in, in Chile, the Madres de la Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, right? They were able to get these messages out by just saying, this goes actually, you know, this goes even against your patriarchal notions of what a good country does for its people, <coughs> even though those are both, especially Madres de la Plaza de Mayo, very radical. Um, at this point, a lot of them started out as people saying, well, you've taken away our children, you've taken away our, our ability to care for our families. So. Yeah, I, I think one of the, the main ways that we can be supportive is, is frankly getting the information out about what the United States has done historically and your historical um, sketch there was, was very useful for that. I think a lot of, of, of well-meaning people get caught up in this notion of we can only defend uh, uh, people's right to choose their own government and, uh, against the United States if we think it's the perfect regime or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that the history of U.S. intervention, for example, in, uh, in Libya, where, which was frankly uh, controlled by a brutal dictator, well, you, you think things can't get worse? Well, look at what happened after the United States started bombing and NATO, et cetera, and, and you've got slavery, you've got uh, uh, a warlordism, and, and people are that much worse thanks to United States intervention. And we've seen that over and over and over again around the world. So it isn't a question of, well, do I think Maduro's perfect or whatever? That's irrelevant. That's for the Venezuelan people to choose. The other thing that I see over and over again on the left in the United States is uh, muting our voices when the Democrats do some of the same crimes that the Republicans do. The 2009 coup in, in Honduras was orchestrated uh, in alliance with Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State. The Obama administration turned uh, its eyes the other way as it did with several other coups around the world, uh, the Maldives for example, Egypt, etc. 
uh, and we lose all credibility in the United States here as a left that is uh, something that other people in the United States would look to if we mute our criticisms when the Democrats do the same thing that the Republicans do. And we've got to stop that, especially in the run-up to 2020 where we're going to be told that our salvation is going to come from this or that. Wonderful politicians saying all sorts of wonderful things. Look at the track record. They all support U.S. military domination of the world through their budgets, if nothing else. Thank you. Your last question. Real quick, I missed most of the first session and maybe this came up. Have you seen in your recent experiences the effects of climate change in Central America uh, adding to the pain and suffering that people are enduring there or destabilizing things even further? I, I can adjust that. I just got back a couple of days ago from Honduras. It was my second trip this year. And, and in Honduras, which is an extremely poor country, still a lot of agricultural and rural communities, there is a historic drought with, and temperature rise. So the, the rains that are needed for planting, which usually should start early April, end of March, are now getting later and later, and they're fewer and fewer, so that sometimes people can't plant uh, until the end of April, and then the season is cut very short. Also, they're losing crops due to the, the higher temperatures and the dryness, and the, in the increasing uh, unpredictable and more severe tropical storms, both on the north, the hurricanes, in the little piece of Honduras, which is on the Pacific, they get all the blowback from these, the cyclones. I think I got that right. So th those are, and that's happening all through Central America, for sure. Yeah, Costa Rica, where hurricanes never actually used to enter because of its position in the, in the ocean, that a hurricane came up along the San Juan River um, two years ago in, in the fall of 2016 and devastated the town of Upala, which is um, a largely Nicaraguan migrant community, um, which is heavily disinvested by both Nicaraguan and Costa Rican governments. And that's not happened before. Costa Rica gets heavy rain when hurricanes come develop. Um, so, you know, Hurricane Mitch, all these others that have devastated Nicaragua, Honduras hasn't come in, but they're now coming on, they're, they're, they're building up and they're, you know, causing immense flooding, ruining, and at the same time, not just people being killed by the flooding, but it's also, they're coming into agricultural zones and, and, and ruin, ruining people's livelihoods as well. And that's so, what, I think what we didn't talk about was the migrant flow and the increase, but I think what this shows is that it, the package of political, economic, and climate change uh, issues, degeneration, um, is, is what's pushing the, the many, many more tens and even hundreds of thousands of people out of their countries um, around the world, but in, in the Americas, out of Central America and Mexico in particular. We've we have a limited supply of reference sheets, so if somebody wants to grab them. And again if there's exactly